be aware that I created these uh, digestive system files more than a year ago. So I might mention snow days <laughs> here and there. Uh, just, you know, ignore me. The content is still good to go. 23A is relatively anatomy rich. On slide two are listed the four main functions of the digestive system. And they are ingestion, taking food in, digestion, breaking food down, absorption, uh, taking into the bloodstream nutrient monomers, and elimination of anything that couldn't be digested, as well as some waste. The chief portion of the digestive system, at least those um, organs that are, that are considered sort of primary organs rather than accessory organs, um, all help collectively to make up our alimentary canal. So from mouth to anus is alimentary canal. Um, alimentary canal is the same gist as saying digestive tract. Our accessory organs are organs that simply help with um, the fulfillment of these different functions. And the accessory organs that we'll talk about most will be the gallbladder, uh, salivary glands, liver, and pancreas. On to slide three. Slide three is a nice overview of all of the organs uh, and their major regions that we'll meet, but we'll also need to learn uh, more detail in this. So this is just an overview. If we go to um, slide four, um, we're actually gonna skip this slide, even though we're not actually going to skip the content of this slide. I just don't need this particular slide and its wordiness to, to help me uh, talk about um, all these different topics. So uh, onward to slide five, we propel foodstuffs through the alimentary canal via two chief um, processes or mechanisms. And one of those is peristalsis which is a, a wave-like series of contractions of the alimentary canal that propels foodstuffs um, mostly forward, so, so distally along the alimentary canal. And um, peristalsis involves adjacent segments. So uh, just as soon as, as uh, oh, my, my pencil's not working this time. Hmm. There we go. Uh, just as soon as one segment is um, done contracting to propel food along, the next segment in line uh, will contract and send food along, and so on and so forth. Whereas, um, we also utilize something that's called segmentation. And this is when non-adjacent segments of the uh, alimentary canal contract. And as a result, we end up sending foodstuffs. So here's an example of a, a lump of foodstuffs, um, both up and down. And um, because non-adjacent segments are, are participating, we end up mixing the food. So much more so uh, segmentation contributes to mixing and much more so peristalsis contributes to propulsion, okay? But ultimately, they both, they both mean food moves along, okay? Moving on to slide six. Hopefully you recall that one of uh, the sila in our, in our bodies is um, the peritoneum, and this is the coelom, or really the serosae, that uh, establish the abdominal cavity or the um, abdominal pelvic cavity. And uh, the peritoneum is actually dual layered. There are two serosae. One of them, of course, is the visceral peritoneum or the visceral serosae, and one is the parietal peritoneum. Those um, 
organs that are housed in our abdominal cavity will have uh, immediate contact with visceral peritoneum, but uh, not quite immediate contact with the parietal peritoneum. The cavity between those two serosae is called the peritoneal cavity, whereas the space uh, deep to the visceral peritoneum is the abdominal cavity. And um, just as we saw with, for instance, the pleurae or even in the pericardium, the serous fluid in the cavity between the two serosae allows for um, very slick gliding-like movement uh, without friction. Now, in our abdominal cavity in particular, the peritoneum here and there gets um, sort of wrapped upon itself in order to make mesentery. And the bad news is, and boy is it bad, uh, the word mesentery is both generic and specific. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll um, discuss that with you as we go. Um, but there are several sheets of mesentery that uh, help to anchor the different organs of the abdominal cavity, at least many of them, uh, as well as provide um, sort of like on-ramps and off-ramps for blood vessels and lymphatics and nerves, um, but also at least some mesenteries will contribute to insulation, so they help keep our, our um, abdominal organs, which are relatively exposed because we don't have the skeletal encasement around our abdomen that we do around, say, our thorax or uh, our brain, right? Um, so insulation as well. So anchorage. Insulation and um, access. These guys, okay. Well, um, the abdominal organs that sit within the abdominal cavity, in other words, they sit deep to visceral um, peritoneum, are called intraperitoneal organs. Whereas there are some that during development. Um, they end up getting sort of pushed outside of the abdominal cavity. And uh, many of them are posterior to the abdominal cavity, but not all. So the, the only steadfast rule is that they're outside of the abdominal cavity. And those are called retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal, okay? You will need to know which abdominal organs are intraperitoneal and which are retroperitoneal. Next slide, which is seven, helps us to better understand, okay, yeah, there's a visceral peritoneum, there's a parietal peritoneum, okay, and evidently, there's some sort of organ <laughs> that's sort of coated by um, visceral peritoneum, okay? When peritoneum folds on itself, so right in here. In fact, let me back up so I can really highlight that for you. Right in here. When it folds on itself, then that's mesentery. So for instance, this particular organ is better supported, better anchored um, dorsally because it's dorsally attached to really the dorsal body wall, okay? Uh, same thing here, parietal peritoneum, same slide, versus visceral peritoneum surrounding an organ, it's our organ, okay? And this peritoneum, sure enough, it folds on itself so that we've got more than one organ, but they're supported both, both dorsally, ventrally, and they're even anchored to each other, which is what's going on right there, okay? 
And that's definitely, we're gonna see all that, that going on. Uh, anchorage to the dorsal body wall, anchorage to the ventral body wall, uh, anchorage to each other, all right? Whereas, in this last image on that same slide number seven, okay, we have peritoneum, but we have an organ, which in the context of this lecture is digestive in function, okay? It's sitting outside of the abdominal cavity. It's sitting sort of superficial to um, both layers of the peritoneum, okay? And this would be a retroperitoneal organ, whereas these two examples are both intraperitoneal, okay? So all the hubbub that you hear is a few students coming into the room. But I'm moving on to slide number eight, which is actually a very, very important slide because it lists all in one place all of the retroperitoneal organs. Uh, not only that, but I, I wrote them in alphabetical order, <laughs> as well as identifies the major mesenteries that you're held responsible for this quarter. So uh, let's learn those. Lesser omentum. Lesser omentum is a specific mesentery. Transverse mesocolon is a specific mesentery. Greater omentum is a specific mesentery. And then here's the really bad news. There is a mesentery, and I'm using that term generally, that is specifically called the mesentery. Yay! Horrible. <laughs> okay, so this guy here, this guy here, that's lesser omentum. Notice that it anchors stomach to liver. Whereas this guy here, which is much more drape or curtain-like, this is the greater omentum. Notice that it hangs down from stomach and is also anchored to transverse colon, which is a portion of the large intestine, as you'll learn later in this chapter. Here, anchoring transverse mesocolon to dorsal body wall. I'm sorry, I just said transverse meso mesocolon, my bad. Um, anchoring transverse colon to the dorsal body wall is the mesentery called the transverse mesocolon. And then here, anchoring almost all, almost all of our small intestine to the dorsal body wall is the mesentery that is unfortunately called the mesentery. So four mesenteries. Now the other pictures here are awesome, um, but this tends to be the, the one I use, D. Um, for instance, if I wanted you to label things on an exam, I tend to use D. Um, but it is, it is smart to look at the other images. Uh, for instance, uh, on A, you can see uh, that the greater omentum is intact and is sort of obscuring our view of large intestine, small intestine, stomach. Whereas in B, the greater omentum has been cut. So that's the cut edge of the greater omentum. What is left intact here, that's the lesser omentum. Again, the mesentery that anchors stomach to liver. The greater omentum doesn't really do much for us in terms of anchorage, but it does prevent twisting, which sounds horrid, uh, and also provides us insulation because it's like a blanket that our, uh, our gut is wearing, okay? In C, the greater omentum isn't cut. It's just flipped up and out of the way, okay? And now we can better see the transverse mesocolon. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. Transverse colon. My bad. And I misspelled it. There we go. Ish. <laughs> Spelling is hard. Okay. And then in the background, in the background, we can see transverse mesocolon. All right, as well as 
mesentery. Recall that mesentery is the mesentery, oh my God, that anchors most of the small intestine, whereas transverse mesocolon is the mesentery that anchors the transverse colon. In either case, these organs or portions, uh, regions, are being anchored to dorsal body wall. Okay. All right, on to... Actually, I'm going to interrupt because... I just received a new model, and I it might help you just just in case, just in case. Okay, this is a transverse section, and it's actually high enough in the body that it's through the thoracic vertebrae. Okay, so there's the body of a thoracic vertebra, and therefore this is diaphragm. This is diaphragm. Okay, uh, here's like the very top or superior most aspect of the abdominal cavity, all right? And hopefully you can infer this is dorsal and this is ventral, okay? This is right, this is left. In other words, it's oriented the same way as the person who's using the camera, okay? Here's liver, here's stomach, Somebody's texting me, so I can't actually see where I'm pointing. <laughs> okay, here's spleen, kidney, kidney, here, aorta, technically thoracic aorta, but just about uh, to transition to abdominal aorta. Here, inferior vena cava, okay, just to orient you a little bit. And what I really wanted to show you was that that this model, because it's it's 3D, you know, there's depth to it. It might help us a little bit more with this whole um, serose idea, okay? Such that this blue, that is peritoneum, okay? This blue, that is peritoneum, this blue, peritoneum, okay? And you can see, especially here, oh yeah, it's all one sheet that's just folded, okay? The space between here, I'm sorry, here, <laughs> the space between the two, okay? It's gaping, whereas when we were studying the pleurae, the space between visceral and parietal pleurae was minute, right? Whereas the, the space in some places uh, between visceral and parietal peritoneum is, is pretty gaping, okay? Notice that this part of that sheet is in contact with the stomach. Therefore, it must be visceral peritoneum. And this one is not in contact with the stomach. Therefore, it must be parietal peritoneum, okay? Visceral, parietal, 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 visceral, parietal, okay? I just thought that depth might help a little bit, okay? Let me know if you have any questions about that model, okay? Let's move on. Slide number nine, um, along the alimentary canal, the wall of our organs typically feature four layers, four tunics, and they are the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and the serosa. So onward to slide, what are we on here, 10? Um, the mucosa is the, the tunic, the layer, that's going to be closest to the lumen. It's going to be in contact with the lumen. And it's in turn made up of three sublayers for maximum fun. And those three sublayers are um, the epithelium that's actually in contact with the, the lumen, a lamina propria, so essentially a, a very beefy basement membrane for that epithelium, and then a layer of, of muscle that's called the muscularis mucosae, not to be confused with muscularis externa. The epithelium that lines um, 
the, the alimentary canal. Most of the alimentary canal is aligned with simple columnar epithelium. But as you know, when we start the alimentary canal, and also when we end the alimentary canal, we're going to see non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and then blend into simple columnar epithelium. We uh, make that transition when we're going from esophagus, which is lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, to uh, stomach, which is lined with simple columnar epithelium. And then we trans, um, gosh, what was the word I just used? Transition uh, back to non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium when we're going from rectum to anus. The anus is lined in non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, regardless, we're definitely going to see many mucus secreting cells embedded in this mucosae and uh, that mucus in part helps to lubricate foodstuffs that are traveling through the tube that is our alimentary canal but also uh, helps to buffer some of the um, very low pH foodstuffs that are coming from, well, are housed in the stomach, but also coming from the stomach. Um, we'll come back to the idea of mucus soon enough. Uh, depending on the organ, the mucosae may also secrete enzymes, digestive enzymes. Um, it may also secrete regulatory hormones, which we'll go over in more detail than you'd like. The lamina propria is comprised of loose areolar connective tissue, which is very, fairly standard for basement membranes. It's got a uh, rich supply of, of blood uh, via capillaries. And this is also where we're likely to find malt so that we can um, prevent microbes from crossing the, the mucosa and entering our bloodstream. And then the muscularis mucosae is comprised of smooth muscle, okay? And this smooth muscle can contract, just like any other smooth muscle would, um, to elicit movement that is local to that particular organ or region. Okay, moving on. Actually, before we move on, I... <laughs> I might as well share this with you. <laughs> um, you notice that I that I neglected to advance the slide in a timely manner. That's because I was <laughs> I was having a silent conversation with my husband um, to determine whether or not he he wanted me to keep a recording. Um, Keeping in mind that his <laughs> fart <laughs> would be <laughs> would be audible to possibly the entire world. So um, if you didn't catch it already, <laughs> rewind and enjoy. On slide 11, we can see um, a model of our four tunics. Um, but slide 11 in particular is highlighting for us the mucosa with an innermost or luminmost epithelium, uh, probably simple columnar, depending on where we are, um, but possibly non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, a connective tissue, loose areolar connective tissue, um, lamina propria underlining that or underlying that, and then a relatively thin layer of smooth muscle called the muscularis mucosae. Moving on to slide 12, the submucosa is also comprised of loose areolar connective tissue like the lamina propria, and being loosely packed, it provides access for lymphatics, blood vessels, um, housing for lymphoid follicles, for instance, Peyer's patches, um, access, an access route for nerves. Um, so nice and loose to provide access and housing, all right? And there's also quite a bit of um, elastic 
uh, fiber in submucosa to allow our allometric canal to stretch and recoil. Um, stretch maybe as a result of consuming or ingesting a large meal, recoil so that it, it uh, takes up minimal space most of the time. Moving on to slide 13, same image, but this time around we're highlighting the submucosa, the submucosa. And notice that the illustrator gave us lots and lots of tubes in this submucosa, as well as the secretory units of glands just to sort of drive home that, that um, access and housing is what submucosae do. Moving on to slide 14. The muscularis externa is a muscular layer. It's comprised of smooth muscle. And through most of the allometric canal, there are actually two layers of smooth muscle in the muscularis externa. There's an inner, an inner layer of muscle that runs, it runs around the tube that is the alimentary canal. And there's an uh, outer longitudinal layer. If this is the tube of our alimentary canal, then that longitudinal layer, the fibers are running this way. Okay, whereas these fibers are running like this. Having both of these in place means that we can, um, we can pinch the tube but also inch the tube. So in other words, um, the alimentary canal can move much like an, like an inchworm would. And then um, again and again and again along the alimentary canal, this muscularis externa will form sphincters. And a sphincter is a ring of muscle have a sphincter at the top of your esophagus, you have a sphincter at the base of your esophagus, um, well, really between the, the base of your esophagus and your stomach, you have a sphincter uh, at the base of your stomach, dividing stomach and the beginning of the small intestine, you have a sphincter at the distal end of your small intestine where it meets large intestine, and um, Probably, if you're already aware of, of any sphincters, they're going to be the anal sphincters. You have two anal sphincters, but we'll come back to those. On to slide 15. The alimentary canal also features, uh, um, obviously, visceral peritoneum. So technically, the outermost layer is going to be serose. And often, often we'll see not just simple squamous epithelium associated with the serosa, but also loose areolar connected tissue, uh, just for even more anchorage and also for even more um, connectivity to mesenteries. Um, however, we do see in the esophagus in particular, this serosa, the serosa features um, not primarily loose areolar connective tissue, but instead fibrous connective tissue, and therefore is referred to as adventitia. Uh, it just makes the esophagus a little better protected since we've got so much going on in the thoracic cavity already. Retroperitoneal organs actually have both adventitia and serosa, which is kind of overkill, but that's how it all lays out. On to slide 16. Splanchnic circulation is the uh, blood supply for the abdominal viscera, and it uh, is delivering oxygen-rich blood via the abdominal aorta. 
some of the chief branches off of the abdominal aorta that are going to feed um, oxygen-rich blood to the abdominal viscera are the celiac trunk. That's a biggie. Um, the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. These branches deliver blood to the liver, the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, uh, the small intestine, the large intestine, and drain from those organs, um, getting, especially from the small intestine, nutrient-rich blood, and sending that blood to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. And those two, the celiac trunk and the hepatic portal vein, I like to really emphasize on the practicum. So those are a couple of, of Tessa favorites. That splenic circulation that's now um, headed to the liver exits the liver via hepatic veins and heads back to the heart via the inferior vena cava. I'm looking at slide 17 now, and in general, we're gonna skip this slide, um, but I would like for you to know that the abdominal viscera, somewhat like, um, say, the, the heart, um, has, has its own private sort of nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system. And some of the uh, reflexes of abdominal organs are overseen strictly by this enteric nervous system. Other reflexes are overseen by um, a cooperative effort between enteric nervous system and um, the, the whole body, <coughs> excuse me, whole body nervous system. We're looking at slide 18 now. And we could see that there are nerve plexi, which is the plural for, for plexus, um, kind of sandwiched around uh, or, or through the muscularis externa. And uh, two of those are the submucosal nerve plexus that sits typically uh, along the border between the submucosa and uh, the circular. This is the, the circular layer of the muscularis externa and the myenteric nerve plexus which typically sits primarily uh, between circular layer and longitudinal layer this is a longitudinal layer wow i do not like the way my handwriting looks there And again, this is circular. And you can see that the fibers are running around our tube versus along our tube in the two different layers. Moving on to 19, the effectors um, regulated by uh, neural influence of the abdominal viscera uh, obviously include smooth muscle, but also include many glands. Many glands. Um, our, our abdominal viscera are regulated by certainly the nervous system, um, both um, the autonomic nervous system and the more local enteric nervous system, but also regulated by hormones. And um, many of those hormones are actually produced by the abdominal viscera. So a lot of these hormones that we're, that we're going to learn in this chapter are hormones that we actually have not learned before. We, we didn't learn them in the endocrine chapter because the endocrine chapter was heavy enough already. And now we're adding some more onto that huge plate. Moving to 
slides 20 and 21, these two slides are, are really one table that's so massive it required two slides. And we'll actually learn many of these hormones as we go through the chapter. So know that this table exists, but um, we're not learning it quite yet. We'll learn it later in this chapter, okay? If I move to slide 22, I can see how some of the uh, sort of classic hormones, those that, that we learn in uh, chapter 16, the endocrine chapter, I can see how uh, they can influence the digestive system. And uh, very quickly, you'll notice that, wow, uh, one of the most influential hormones on the digestive system is insulin. And in fact, insulin is the chief hormone that's produced, that's regulating activity during what's called the absorptive state. The absorptive state is the period during um, the consumption or ingestion of a meal and, and also the, the time just after eating that meal when we have oodles of nutrient monomers flooding into the bloodstream from primarily the small intestine. And during the absorptive state, our anabolic efforts outweigh our catabolic efforts. And you may already know or you may recall that anabolism is um, the building of, of uh, molecules where catabolism is the breaking down of molecules. So once we have hold of those monomers during the absorptive state, we're using them to build things, okay? And our main source of energy during the absorptive state is glucose glucose, with a few exceptions. Um, in the liver, in adipose tissue, in cardiac muscle cells, in skeletal muscle cells, uh, glucose isn't the go-to fuel source during the absorptive state. It's triglycerides. These, these guys lean on triglycerides as their primary source of energy. But everywhere else in the body, uh, glucose is going to be the main energy source during the absor absorptive state. Whereas amino acids that, that are flooding into the bloodstream, um, lipid monomers that are flooding into the bloodstream, those are being used for, again, anabolism. We are building, uh, typically remaking, uh, body proteins and fats that were previously de degraded. And if we degraded um, body proteins and, and fats um, previously, we did that probably during the post-absorptive state. And during the post-absorptive state, the GI tract, the, the alimentary canal is relatively empty. So this is the period between meals. And during the post-absorptive state, uh, catabolism is increasing and may even outweigh anabolism. Primarily during the post-absorptive state, our concern is uh, keeping glucose levels in the blood steady. And one, one way to kind of keep that in mind is that, uh, recall, your neurons, they use glucose uh, exclusively and, um, and hungrily for that matter. So um, they, your, your brain, for instance, needs a continuous supply. We can't allow blood glucose to um, to fall significantly or our neurons will be in, in trouble. So during the post-absorptive state, we're really promoting glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And one of the hormones that's often at play here rather than insulin is gonna be glucagon, which is hopefully not, not surprising considering uh, their, their antagonist-like effects. Moving on to slide 23, um, the job really of the mouth and, um, and certainly the teeth and the salivary glands and the tongue uh, is to form a bolus. And a bolus 
is a ball of food, uh, saliva and mucus that's formed after we've um, mixed, mixed uh, that mucus, that saliva, those enzymes within and that food. The bolus is formed and it's actually the bolus that we swallow. Having a hard palate to work against allows us not only to form that bolus, but also to swallow. Uh, we press against that hard palate. We raise uh, sort of the roof of our tongue up against the, the hard palate and push that bolus down, down the throat, down the esophagus, I should say. Okay, I'm looking at 24. And um, on 24, we're just reiterating, hey, look, I know what a hard palate is. And hey, look, I know what a soft palate is. Hey, look, I know that the soft palate uh, takes a dingle dangle turn to form the uvula. Hey, look, uh, an, an oropharynx. Hey, look, a laryngopharynx. Um, here's the epiglottis. Here's uh, trachea. Here's esophagus, just sort of reviewing our, our anatomy, okay? And the next slide, 25, we're gonna skip this quarter. Uh, even though, sure, there are some terms here that we know, there are other terms that we're skipping this quarter, okay? I'm not gonna cross all of them out, I'm just trying to show you um, why we're skipping this one. Um, well, the why is really because it's not exclusively or expressly. Um, in the, the curriculum. Moving to chapter, not chapter, good grief, the slide. Number 26, uh, the salivary glands. So our, our salivary glands, um, they help to kind of keep washing, flushing the mouth. They provide um, solvent continuously so that we can dissolve um, what you might think of as flavor molecules, food, food molecules, or tastants. Um, they help to apply moisture or convey moisture to uh, the food that we consume, um, which in turn helps us to compact that food into that bolus. And they also contain enzymes. And one of the chief enzymes contained in saliva is amylase, uh, which allows us to break down uh, carbohydrates, especially starches, starches. So um, the three main salivary glands are the parotid, the submandibular, and the sublingual. They're paired, so you have right and left, right and left, right and left, so really you have six of them. And um, they feature serous cells that are making an enzyme-rich kind of uh, thin, watery secretion, and mucus cells, obviously a, a thicker secretion. Uh, so so uh, we can end up with, depending on which is more, more um, prevalent in a particular salivary gland, we can end up with a saliva that's more mucusy. We can end up with a saliva that's more uh, kind of watery, but, but more enzyme rich. And in the parotid glands and the submandibular glands, we have a greater proportion of serous cells. So they make an enzyme rich watery saliva uh, more so. Whereas the sublingual glands uh, they make, or yeah, they make, um, or not make, but they, they feature uh, more so mucus cells. So they make a, a, a thicker, uh, less enzyme-rich saliva. Saliva in general is mostly water with um, ions. Electrolyte means ion. And of course, um, digestive enzymes lots of amylase, but also some lipase, um, some lysozyme, uh, external innate defenses, uh, is a secretion. So I'm expecting immunoglobulin A, uh, some urea and uric acid, which, which uh, might surprise you, defensins, uh, yet again, uh, external innate defenses, uh, as well as mucus, of course, and uh, nitric oxide. And salivary glands are stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous pathway. 
Moving to slide 27, here I can see the relatively large parotid gland that sits um, just lateral to the, the, mass in it, uh, the masseter uh, muscle. Here, I'm seeing the submandibular gland uh, inferior to the mandible is sort of what that, what that means. And then here, I'm seeing the sublingual gland uh, inferior or under um, subordinate, if you will, to the tongue. That's what sublingual means, okay? And of course, these are paired right and left. And then on slide 28, uh, you see my note that says we're skipping. We're skipping um, all the sort of tooth detail uh, this quarter um, because it's not emphasized in the curriculum.